Hi, and welcome at this workshop for GPU programming in Julia. I'm Tim, I'm a software engineer at Julia Computing, and today I'll be talking about CUDA.jl, a package you can use to program NVIDIA GPUs in Julia with a focus on both ease of use and high performance. So for a brief outline of this workshop, I'll start with an introduction on the Julia programming language and why it's an interesting language for GPU computing. And then I'll explain how to set up CUDA.jl and I'll continue with explaining the different programming interfaces, both array programming and more low-level kernel programming. And in between, I'll explain some tools on how to profile the performance and how to measure the performance of your GPU application written in Julia. So first of all, what makes Julia a good programming language for working with GPUs? Well, if we look at uh, why Julia is interesting for CPU programming, we have a couple of well-known advantages. Um, it's a powerful high-level language. We have great performance, as you can see in these micro benchmarks, comparing the performance to, of Julia to C. And as a result, uh, the language solves the so-called two-language problem, making it possible to write your code that has to perform well in the same language where you've written your application in without having to drop down to a lower level high performance language like C, C++, Fortran, and so on. So what we've done with CUDA.jl and the other GPU backends is to extend this functionality, these properties of the language to GPU programming. So we like to make as much of the powerful high-level language you're used to available for GPU kernels, uh, while at the same time retaining the great performance of the language. And again, here's a, a small difference comparing some benchmarks from the Rodinia benchmark suite um, ported to Julia and comparing the performance of those ports to the original C versions compiled with MVCC, which is NVIDIA C compiler. And as you can see, the performance is, is good, we don't lose any performance. In fact, there's a small performance improvement. So as a result, we argue that programming GPUs in Julia also solves the two language problem because, for example, in the case of CUDA.gl, you don't necessarily have to use CUDA C anymore because you can write both your high-level application and your GPU kernels in the same language. So you can use Julia across all levels of the sect, from the application down to the custom kernels. So if you have a look at how this looks at the application level, there's a couple of Julia applications that have GPU acceleration baked into them. For example, the Flux package, uh, which is a deep learning package in Julia, has GPU support and it exposes that using the GPU function, which you can use to up upload your models as well as your data to the GPU. And if you then evaluate your GPU model on GPU data, everything will execute on the GPU. Of course, these interfaces are custom to the application, so we won't go into detail. Um, but it's, it's important to say that most of this functionality is built on top of the generic array abstractions that we offer. Um, so here's a, a hypothetical uh, GPU package exposing a GPU array type which you can then use to perform generic array operations on. And because you're working with a GPU array type, these executions will happen on the GPU. For example, here, evaluating that sign will happen on the GPU that's backing the GPU type for which, which we've instantiated an array type here. But this isn't... Uh, this isn't limited to generic array operations. You can always write your own kernels using the more low-level kernel programming interface that we also have available in Julia, offering both the performance and the flexibility that low-level languages like CUDA C normally do. So again, in, in the same way that the array abstraction level uh, reused quite some code across all of our GPU backends by building on top of the GPU arrays package. Here, lots of this compiler functionality is shared across backends because of the GPU compiler package. Now, for the rest of this workshop, I'll be focusing on CUDA.gl, uh, even though the other packages have similar capabilities and programming interfaces, because CUDA.gl is the most mature package and we have a whole bunch of tools from NVIDIA like profilers, uh, memory sanitizers, and so on, which I'll demonstrate later in this workshop. So if you want to start with CUDA.gl, it's basically as easy as uh, installing Julia, of course. 
entering the package manager, and then you can just do add CUDA to install CUDA.gl. And when you do using CUDA, you import the package. And when you do any functionality, for example, here I'm calling the version info function to get little details on the tool chain, will automatically download an appropriate CUDA toolkit for your system. And this is very valuable because as many people will know, it's fairly tricky to uh, set up CUDA appropriately for your system and your GPU. So we try to take that out of your hands and do as much as, uh, as possible automatically. The only thing you still require is, of course, an NVIDIA driver, which you cannot, which we cannot provide because it's part of the operating system. If you're working on a cluster, this may actually be unwanted because the cluster might have a CUDA toolkit installation by itself. So you can circumvent this mechanism by defining the environment variable, Julia CUDA use binary builder and set it to false. In which case CUDA.gl will just look into your system for a local CUDA installation. If you don't have a GPU in your local system, you can also use Julia Hub which is uh, one of the products of Julia Computing, where we have a cloud environment that you can easily boot up. Uh, you can uh, give it a couple of GPUs and you can use a remote Visual Studio code to execute GPU code on that cloud instance. And this is a very convenient way to get started with GPU, GPU programming or try and port some of your existing codes to the GPU if you don't have a GPU locally. Of course, this audience will probably have access to a cluster where GPU resources will be abundant. But nonetheless, if you want to try something out uh, and the cluster is not available, then Julia Hub is a great way to do so. So once you have your system set up, you have a, a system with a GPU, you have CUDA.gl installed, um, you can start to use the CUDA type to manage your memory with the same APIs as you would with the base.array type. For example, we can allocate an array, uh, we can give it a couple of undefined values, but we set the size. Uh, you can create similar arrays, uh, you can initialize array and upload data, and you can download the data back by calling the array constructor. So all of these APIs, we try to make them as similar as possible to the base array type that works on the CPU, so that you can take existing codes that you've developed for the CPU and just execute them using the CUDA type, and as a result, get GPU execution. For APIs that do not take a type argument, we have module prefix version. For example, RAND will always allocate the CPU array. So we have CUDA.RAND to, uh, to generate a CUDA array with random numbers. The same for this one, the same for this ones and zeros function or this follow function. Um, but of course, much more importantly, the CUDA array type is not only used for memory storage, it, it's also used to execute code on the GPU. Say we allocate a small QRA as I do here, if we then call the sum function or we multiply our array by two, this will automatically execute on your GPU uh, by using or generating even a GPU kernel behind the scenes. It will automatically specialize based on the types that you have. If you switch your array from 32-bit floating point to 64-bit floating point, the operation will still work, but it will recompile um, for the new element types at hand. And of course, when possible, we try to use NVIDIA's libraries because those have been optimized and are known to perform well. Uh, say, if you call the rand bank function on an array, which fills an array with random numbers, if the element types permit it, we will dispatch to the current library by NVIDIA. Um, if you do a matrix multiplication, again, if Kublas supports it, we'll be using the functionality for Kublas and so on and so forth. We also always try to provide a generic fallback uh, version natively implemented in Julia, meaning if you do a matrix multiplication with some uh, very weird types that Kublas doesn't support, we fall back to our native implementation of matrix multiplication so that your code still work. But the real power from these, uh, from these array operations comes from the higher order abstractions that Julia also have. Um, so here I'm allocating again two dummy arrays, and then I'm demonstrating, for example, the map function. And the map function in Julia takes an anonymous function, which is the do block here, where I can specify whatever transformation I want to do with the elements of my array. Uh, 
And this invocation as a whole to the definition of the map function, as well as your user provided anonymous function, which here just adds one to every element, will be compiled together into a single kernel. And you can do it a little more complex. For example, the line below does uh, an element-wise addition of A with two times B. All that will again be compiled into a single kernel. Uh, we also have more complicated parallel patterns like, uh, for example, the reduce function, map reduce as well, or the accumulate function. Uh, another example is the find first function. And as you can see, all of these are higher order functions. They again take some uh, anonymous function from the user and they compose it together and compile a specialized kernel for your GPU without you having ever written a GPU kernel or even knowing what CUDA is. So and this is really powerful because it, 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 it often obviates the needs for custom kernels, it makes it possible to write generic code that works both on the CPU and on the GPU, and you can execute it on the GPU without even knowing how a parallel uh, implementation of any of these abstractions would work. And that's really powerful. Lots of applications are strictly built on top of this without containing any custom kernels. And as a, as a silly example, here, here's some machine learning code I took from the discourse channels, uh, Julia's uh, discussion forums a couple of years ago, where this user was defining um, a loss function, a gradient a derivative, a small training loop, which does a proximal gradient descent, and then allocates some, some data to feed to the model. And this is, of course, executing on a CPU because, for example, of the RAND function of all of our model parameters are located on the CPU. And if you want to execute this on the GPU, it's just as easy as moving the weights, the inputs, and the outputs to a Kure, evaluating your model again. And all of the functions we're calling here, for example, the LMOF bank function, uh, our loss, our gradient, but also the matrix multiplication and so on, all of that will automatically execute on the GPU. And it'll even outperform the CPU as, as easy as that without having to do any, any optimization. Of course, this is a cherry picked example. It's the best case scenario where each of these oper op operations that I'm doing is in this example have been implemented and optimized in CUDA.gl. And it can happen that this is not the case. For example, up until a while ago, the norm function was not implemented. And if you executed the norm function on a CUDA array, you got this warning, warning performance scalar operations on a GPU array. And that's because we were falling back to a implementation in base Julia, which implements the norm, which calculates the norm, but does so in a way that it's iterating element by element and doing something with every element. And that's of course bad because that iteration happens on the CPU. So you're essentially uploading data to the GPU and then transforming element by element back to the CPU, doing a computation and uploading it back to the GPU. And as a result, as you can see, if we evaluate this using our benchmark tools package, you can see that the evaluation on the CPU took three microseconds while evaluation on the GPU performing scalar iteration took nine milliseconds. So this is extremely slow and this is something you want to avoid and you can do so easily by disallowing the scalar iteration. And I'm mentioning this here because it's a very common pitfall. It's very convenient when you're porting code because you can, you can take an existing application, you can run it on the GPU and you can see, oh, this and that operation has not been optimized or implemented yet. We'll need to find an alternative or we'll need to create a pull request to CUDA.gl to implement that operation. Uh, but at least it allows you to run your application front to back and verify that the results are correct. So this is mainly uh, a feature that's there to facilitate porting code from the CPU or from another language to the GPU. And this is a great reason why you might look into implementing a custom kernel um, because an operation was not supported. Another reason you might want to implement a custom kernel is because, is because some operation is slow. For example, here I'm doing a very silly example. I'm allocating an array and then I'm element-wise adding an array to its reverse. And this kind of invocation where we do the element-wise uh, addition to something that's been returned by a function has not been fused into a single kernel. So this launches two kernels, one for the element-wise, one for the reversal and one for the element-wise addition. 
And that's sometimes bad because if, if you can fuse things together, you avoid this global intermediary allocation and you can also allow the compiler to do more optimization. So it might be possible that this kind of inv invocation is slow. And this is a nice segue into how you actually do performance profiling using Julia and CUDA code. Uh, because you might be tempted to just put the at time macro, which is a commonly used uh, macro in the Julia world, in front of a GPU invocation. And here you can see that the invocation is suspiciously fast. Uh, and that's because it's an invalid way of doing things. Because most GPU operations are invoked asynchronously. The CPU is not going to wait by default uh, for the GPU to finish. And the advantage of that is that you can queue up multiple GPU operations and only wait for the last one to return. Of course, this spoils our time measurements. And in order to do proper time measurements, we have to put this at sync in front of our um, operation. This is going to synchronize the GPU in a, in a similar way that the add sync macro and base Julia synchronizes tasks. That's why we, we've named it as such. You also have just a synchronized function, which resembles more what you have in CUDA C. Uh, we have a shorthand for that. You can just do CUDA.add time, in which case you also get some additional information of the number of GPU allocations. And here we can see, as I mentioned, that there's two allocations, one for the uh, output the intermediary output of the reverse function, and then another allocation for our final result. And another thing I mentioned before, which I heartily recommend you to use, is the at benchmark and at B time macro from the benchmark tools package, which is a very convenient Julia package that does statistically sound evaluation of your function, aggregates the results, and presents a typically much more accurate uh, execution time of the code. So here we can see that our invocation takes 1.1 milliseconds. Um, whereas on the CPU, it takes 47 milliseconds. So even though we're doing something potentially inefficient here by launching two kernels, it's already very much faster than it would be on the CPU. But still, let's, let's try and optimize this. So NVIDIA has, has a couple of great tools for that. Um, they have uh, the Insight suite of tools, which are profilers, and there, there's three of them. There's Insight systems for application profiling, and then depending on where the culprit is, you either use Insight graphics or Insight compute for a detailed view of your performance. But Insight systems is typically the, the go-to tool if you want to analyze performance of your GPU application. So here I'll... Uh, I'll show you how to use that. You can just do ANSYS profile of Julia, and then in your Julia session, you perform a couple of GPU operations. If you quit, you get a report, and then you can open that report using uh, ANSYS systems. But with Julia, there's, there's actually a much more better way. You can do ANSYS launch, in which case you can interactively profile. So every time you evaluate a call to uh, a set of operations, and you put CUDA.add profile in front, when that expression finishes, it will write a report file without you having to quit Julia. And this makes it possible to interactively develop a GPU application. You can, for example, with revise.gl, which is similar to Python's auto hot reload, you can just have your editor open, you can make some changes, go back to your REPL, evaluate the code again, get a new report, open it in Insight Systems, and so on and so forth. So this is a great way of implementing and optimizing your Julia GPU application. So the resulting report files, you can either use ANSYS stats for that, or you can much more nicely use the GUI, um, which here shows you that there's two kernel invocations, as I've been mentioning for a while. So on the top, you can see the Julia runtime interfacing with CUDA APIs. And on the bottom, you can see the hardware, where it's actually running two kernels, one generic kernel and then a broadcast kernel. So this is probably a little slow because we are launching two kernels. The other tool I mentioned is Insight Compute, but you generally shouldn't use this. Only when you want to do a deep dive optimization of a single kernel, you can use uh, Ansys uh, CU. Again, with dash dash mode equals launch, uh, in which case you can do so interactively and it gives you plenty of gory details about what the hardware is doing and uh, what the utilization of the compute and the bandwidth of the GPU is. 
But that's not relevant today. If you want more details on how to use this in the CUDA.jl documentation, there's a section on how to profile your application, and all of this is explained in detail. So back to our uh, application profile, we see two invocations of, of a kernel here. So this, this is probably expensive. Let's try to implement a custom kernel to merge these operations together. So what you can do in Julia is you can, you can write your own kernel functions. So here I'm implementing a vAd reverse function, which is combining the vector addition and the reversal. It takes three arguments. One is the output container, then there's the two inputs. Um, it does this thread index function, which is something from CUDA C. So again, we, we, we try to stay at the same abstraction level, at least with our kernel programming interface. And then I'm calling the reverse function on my input. Uh, however, if I want to launch this, and launching I do with the add CUDA macro, you can see a, a, a pesky error you might run into quite often uh, once you're, if you're initially developing or porting code. That's that there is an invalid IR error, the failure to compile the vAd reverse kernel. And this is, this is um, going against what Julia normally does, namely that it, it will never, never throw a compilation error at you. It will let you run everything and it will error at runtime. If you do something invalid, uh, it's a dynamically typed language. So if you use wrong types or you call the, the wrong function or you have a typo, you'll just get a runtime function. You won't have a statically checked environment. However, when we compile for the GPU, we actually do need to compile much more statically. We, we cannot afford to, for example, do a garbage collected allocation at runtime just because there is a typo in your function. And as a result, uh, we'll, we'll present you much more eagerly with, uh, for example, here, the invalid IR errors, which occurred because we're doing something invalid in our kernel definition. And that's because essentially not everything from the Julia language is supported. Uh, and the restriction comes from not supporting the Julia runtime. So even though we've solved two language problems, as we all mentioned a number of times, some parts of Julia itself are still implemented in C. For example, the garbage collector is uh, the compiler itself, uh, some input output. And as a result, you cannot use those functions in your kernels because the runtime is implemented in C for the CPU. And we cannot just link that together with our GPU code, or at least not currently. So there's a couple of things you need to avoid. And here, the, the culprit is the reverse function. If I call reverse on B, it'll perform a temporary allocation. And that allocation is garbage collected and not supported in a GPU kernel. So instead of doing the reversal, we'll just do it ourselves. We do B, and then we calculate the index we want to access. It's the end index minus I plus 1. And now we want to launch this on our one 10 million uh, element array. And now we get a CUDA error. So I'm just highlighting all the common errors you might run into this. The typical development experience is much more friendly. So the reason this is, and it illustrates nicely, is that we, we still have to obey by CUDA's restrictions itself. And here, it's not allowed to launch more than 1,024 threads per block. For us, I'm specifying threads equal the length of A here. So that means it's about 10 million. So that's disallowed. So what you do in CUDA C, and you consequently also have to do in Julia when developing your own kernels, is you do this typical uh, block index times block dimension plus thread index invocation. And then instead of one humongous block of 10 million threads, you launch only 1,024 threads, and you compute how many blocks of these threads you have to launch. And lo and behold, this already performs uh, a little bit better than our previous implementation with two kernels. We went from 1.1 milliseconds to 720 microseconds. So this is definitely a worthwhile improvement. And we can also use the, the occupancy API for those familiar with CUDA to automatically calculate how many threads are optimal for this kernel invocation. Um, and this is, this is an example of a higher level API that we offer you in order to facilitate programming and CUDA kernels in Julia, even though we're not, we're not changing the abstraction model in any way. 
And that's something you, you see all over the place. So this is a, a quick example of some common functionality from CUDA C in CUDA.gl. So as I mentioned and demonstrated, you have all of the thread index, block dimension, and other indexing intrinsics. Uh, we support cooperative groups. You can allocate shared memory with some syntax that looks similar, but is slightly more user-friendly. Um, and so the story is always the abstraction level is essentially the same, but we try to make it as user friendly as possible. Um, the, the atomics is a nice example for that. In CUDA C, you, you would call the atomic add function, so you need to know which exact atomics are supported, where in CUDA.gl you can just do add atomic of a certain operation and it will automatically dispatch to one of the lower level uh, intrinsic functions that CUDA provides. Uh, so similarly, in terms of, of performance optimization, uh, the same rules as that you have in CUDA C apply. You have to avoid, avoid thread divergence. Uh, you have to reduce and coalesce global accesses. You have to make sure that your occupancy is OK, uh, optimize launch configuration, and so on. So these are all typical CUDA C optimization guidelines for GPU kernels. There's a couple that's, that's relevant and only specific to Julia. Namely, um, because Julia is garbage collected, it might take a while before your GPU allocations are freed again, uh, which sometimes creates a lot of memory pressure. And you can avoid that by calling the CUDA.unsafe free function. Um, you also want to avoid exception branches. So for example, we do, we do support uh, bounce errors. We do support exceptions that get thrown when you convert invalid values from one type to another. And those typically generate additional branches that do a check and have a, a, a fail path that might, might be costly in, in some hot, hot path code. Um, and another big one is that typically all of your literals in Julia are 64 bits. So floating point literals and uh, integer literals are all 64 bits, which can sometimes take up some precious register space that you might need in kernel functions. So it might be interesting to stick to 32 bit integers there. We also have a couple of lower level tools to help you there. Um, so for example, you can do add device code LLVM. Uh, you can stick that in front of virtually anything, and then you get to see all of the LLVM code that was generated by CUDA.gl for your GPU kernels. And this, this can help you in optimizing uh, the kernels you've written. You can do the same with a device code PTX to see the virtual PTX code that was generated. You can also do so with uh, a device code SAS to see the shader assembly. So we give you quite some tools to uh, peek into the compiler and, and see what, it, what it's doing or to optimize things. It can also be helpful to debug issues. For example, here I'm running a kernel and it fails to compile due to some invalid IR error. We can use, and, and typically this is caused by uh, dynamically typed function, the so-called type unstable invocations you might be familiar with if you've programmed in Julia. And a way to debug these is to use the uh, at device code one type function. Again, put that in front of anything, and you can see the Julia IR annotated with some colors. And we, here we can see a bunch of anys, which means that there's some type unstable code in our implementation. And if we look at where that comes from, that's just because we have a typo. We, we, we've written thread ID instead of thread index. So if we, if we change it, it compiles correctly again. And if you'd run into some more deeper issues, uh, for example, some called function has a typo and you don't immediately see this with the uh, at device code one type, you can use Cthulhu, which is a, an interactive tool that uh, lets you explore all of the Julia IR that's generated. And we also integrate with all of uh, NVIDIA's tools. For example, here I have a, a dummy kernel where I do something with shared memory, but I conveniently forgot to call the sync threads function. If we, if, if we run Julia under compute sanitizer and enable the race check function, we can see that there is a, a detective race and it even prints some debug information in terms of the name of the kernel and the location of the read access. And finally, there's a whole bunch of much more advanced functionality behind the scenes. Um, so we, for example, wrap all of the CUDA driver API in high level wrappers. So if, if you need to inspect device properties, create your own context or allocate special buffers, it's all possible using lots of advanced functionality 
that's a little bit out of scope for this talk, so I'll keep it short. And similarly to what uh, Abel mentioned, we also support um, C style calls where you can just basically take CUDA C code and use the exact same functions, the exact same API calls of your application interfacing with CUDA driver, which makes it on the one hand much more flexible because you can use uh, functionality that we may not have wrapped in high level functionality, but it also greatly simplifies porting existing applications because you can just access all of the functions you had been accessing before in your C application. So in summary, I think Julia has a great language for programming across all levels of a GPU application here specifically, uh, CUDA, uh, for CUDA GPUs. So you can work with arrays, which is much easier because you don't need kernels and it makes it possible to write highly generic code that works across multiple GPUs or even across the CPU and the GPU. And if necessary, you can always write your own kernels um, and, and you can do so at the same level of performance and flexibility as you would in CUDA C. And to facilitate all that, we give you a whole bunch of powerful tools, uh, both for novices and expert GPU programmers to optimize or debug applications. If you want any more details, uh, we have some documentation on the CUDA.gl repository. There's also a landing page in juliagpu.org, and there's a blog over there where we uh, post updates on package updates or when there's new GPU backends released and so on and so forth. For example, soon there'll be a blog post about the upcoming metal.gl package, which will make it possible to program uh, GPUs in your MacBook if you have any. And this is around half an hour, so I'll keep it at that. Um, I'll have a look at the chat to see if there's any questions I should respond to. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. So, uh, first question from Kaspar is, do you have support for tensor cores directly, or would you need to use something like Kublas? Uh, yes, we support tensor cores, so you can use the tensor cores uh, WMMA within your kernels. However, it's a surprisingly verbose interface. Uh, it, it might, for the most users, it's easier to just use Kublas. And with Kublas, we should be automatically dispatching and configuring the library such that it uses tensor cores accelerated APIs. But if you want to have all the flexibility, it's possible to use the tensor cores in your kernels, yes. Okay, uh, Kaspar has another question on the CPU profiling you showed earlier, uh, slide 21. What exactly is included in the timing if that includes the GPU to CPU copy? Yes, it's the full application time. Uh, start to end. So the uh, the Rodinia applications, um, the way we measure it was from the start, upload all of the data and initialize all the data up until the very end where we download results just before verification. Um, so it is a, a all encompassing comparison. Okay. A uh, question that might not be directly related to CUDA.jl is since you start the code from pure Julia and then translate in a number of steps to say NVIDIA PTX, can you target uh, embedded devices? Does this become a problem? Um, like a microcontroller Raspberry Pi or Arduino? Well, the, the, so the GPU compiler functionality that we have developed can be used to compile static code that can be executed on embedded environments. For example, recently somebody used GPU compiler to target AVR microcontrollers, so the very tiny 8-bit ones. So yeah, I mean, it's it's not, uh, unless I don't see the link to GPU compilation, um, the, the infrastructure we have can be used for that purpose, that, definitely. Okay. Um, a question from Naumann that I don't know exactly what he means, but can we link it with some other language? I'm not sure what approach he means there. Um, yeah, well, so in CUDA, you have this concept called the primary context, where if you use functionality that uses the CUDA runtime, which is most CUDA applications out there, um, you can make sure that they can interoperate by using the same uh, the same context. And CUDA.gl does use the primary context, which, meaning it's, which means it's compatible with other uh, CUDA applications as long as they also use the primary context, which is most of the applications that have been written in CUDA C using the CUDA runtime libraries, which is 99% of the, of the applications out there. And in terms of allocations, um, all of the allocations that we do for Kuray, they also are portable across, um, across languages because all of these applications are 
just divide the global applications that are uh, allocated using the global allocator. So again, we should be portable there uh, as far as possible or as far as I know there could be issues with interfacing with other GPU applications. Okay. Um, Gil asks if there will be more support for AMD GPUs. Yes, the uh, AMD GPU package is under heavy development and it's starting to become very, very powerful. I'm not personally involved, but for the upcoming supercomputers, some of which are going to be AMD based, uh, there is a development uptick on AMD GPU.gl. So I definitely recommend checking out. One of the issues there is that the whole um, AMD software solution is not as portable and not as compatible across all of the hardware, which makes it a little bit less user-friendly than the CUDA.gl approach. But the package itself and the programming support itself is essentially fairly capable as well. So yeah, definitely recommend checking it out if you're interested. Okay. Uh, one question from Hanno, which is uh, about the two language problem and the way that Julia solves it. His remark is that Python plus the Numba JIT compiler more or less also solved it. Yeah. It's yes, that's like from right. I, I didn't go into much detail here, uh, also in the interest of time, but th there is a difference in how Numba implements uh, Python support for kernel programming and we do, namely that Numba is a parallel compiler. It's, it's a separate implementation of the Python language uh, that doesn't integrate with, say, C Python or the other main interpreter. And that results oftentimes in some functionality being not supported or the number implementation lagging a little bit on the reference implementation. Whereas uh, part of my research a couple of years ago was to try and interface as much as possible with the main Julia compiler. So CUDA.gl does not know how to work with Julia code in a way. It just reuses the existing Julia compiler uh, as much as possible uh, up until LLVM IR code is generated. And at that point, it, it continues down the chain in, in order to make that code GPU compatible. I mean, there's, there's lots of, of technical details here I'm leaving out, but one of the advantages of the Julia approach is uh, in, in increased compatibility with uh, the language as such. You can, for example, define structures as much as you want, whereas user defined types and number has, I'm not sure what the current status is, but I know that when I looked at it a couple of years ago, there was one, one tricky part of it. Of course, we still have some compatibility issues. We don't support the runtime, as I mentioned, but those stem technically from a, a completely different uh, reason than an inherent second implementation of the compiler does. Okay. Um, yeah, I think number is a topic we could go into more, but it's a little bit outside of the scope of this webinar. Um, a question from my side, when you use CUDA with C++, how does that compare to using it from Julia? Are there things that you can do in C++ that don't work in Julia? You mean programming kernels from C++? Well, the, 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 let's say all the, the ways that you can use CUDA from C++, indeed the kernels, but also all the, all the other uh, like synchronization stuff. Is there anything that, it, how does CUDA JL compare to using CUDA from C++? Is it fully equivalent or are there limitations? Uh, well, flexibility wise, it should be fully, fully equivalent. I'm not too experienced with the new um, interfaces that NVIDIA has been developing. I'm, I'm guessing you mentioned, you're, you're, you're hinting at uh, LibCU++ and all of the new C++ based uh, development where they are much more leaning on uh, parallel abstractions where you then can do a parallel four and so on and so forth. Uh, using STL constructs to automatically compile down to kernels. Uh, I'm guessing that's fairly similar to the array abstractions we, we nowadays have, or we always have had in Julia, where you can do just parallel abstractions and expect them to get compiled automatically down to a kernel that's sufficiently uh, performant. Uh, 